chapter eight of moods this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen moods by louisa may alcott chapter eight no drawn curtains shut out the frosty night the first fire of the season burned upon the hearth and basking in its glow sat sylvia letting her thoughts wander where they would as books most freely open at pages oftenest read the romance of her summer life seldom failed to unclose at passages where warwick's name appeared pleasant as were many hours of that time none seemed so full of beauty as those passed with him and sweetest of them all the twilight journey hand in hand it now returned to her so freshly that she seemed to hear again the evening sounds to feel the warm fern-scented wind blow over her to see the strong hand offered helpfully and with an impulse past control she stretched her own to that visionary warwick as the longing of her heart found vent in an eager come i am here a voice replied a hand pressed hers and springing up she saw not adam but moore standing beside her with a beaming face concealing the thrill of joy the pang of pain he had brought her she greeted him cordially and reseating herself instinctively tried to turn the current of her thoughts i am glad you came for i have built castles in the air long enough and you will give me more substantial entertainment as you always do the broken dream had left tokens of its presence in the unwonted warmth of sylvia's manner moore felt it and for a moment did not answer much of her former shyness had crept over her of late she sometimes shunned him was less free in conversation less frank in demonstration and once or twice had coloured deeply as she caught his eye upon her these betrayals of warwick's image in her thoughts seemed to more the happy omens he had waited eagerly to see and each day his hope grew more assured he had watched her unseen while she was busied with her mental pastime and as he looked his heart had grown unspeakably tender for never had her power over him been so fully felt and never had he so longed to claim her in the name of his exceeding love a pleasant peace reigned through the house the girl sat waiting at his side the moment looked auspicious the desire grew irresistible and he yielded to it you are thinking of something new and pleasant to tell me i hope something in keeping with this quiet place and hour said sylvia glancing up at him with the traitorous softness still in her eyes yes and hoping you would like it then i have never heard it here before never from me go on please i am ready she folded her hands together on her knee turned her face attentively to his and unwittingly composed herself to listen to the sweet story so often told and yet so hard to tell more meant to woo her very gently for he believed that love was new to her he had planned many graceful illustrations for his tale and rounded many smoothly flowing sentences in which to unfold it but the emotions are not well bred and when the moment came nature conquered art no demonstration seemed beautiful enough to grace the betrayal of his passion no language eloquent enough to tell it no power strong enough to hold in check the impulse that mastered him he went to her knelt down upon the cushion at her feet and lifting to her a face flushed and fervent with the ardour of a man's first love said impetuously sylvia read it here there was no need for her to look act touch and tone told the story better than the most impassioned speech the supplication of his attitude the eager beating of his heart the tender pressure of his hand dispelled her blindness in the drawing of a breath and showed her what she had done now neglected warnings selfish forgetfulness and the knowledge of an unconscious but irremediable wrong frightened and bewildered her she hid her face and shrunk back trembling with remorse and shame more seeing in her agitation only maiden happiness or hesitancy accepted and enjoyed a blissful moment while he waited her reply it was so long in coming that he gently tried to draw her hands away and look into her face whispering like one scarcely doubtful of assent you love me sylvia no 
only half audible was the reluctant answer yet he heard it smiled at what he fancied a shy falsehood and said tenderly will you let me love you dear no fainter than before was the one word but it reached and startled him hurriedly he asked am i nothing to you but a friend no with a quick gesture he put down her hands and looked at her grief regret and pity filled her face with trouble but no love was there he saw yet would not believe the truth felt that the sweet certainty of love had gone yet could not relinquish the fond hope sylvia do you understand me i do i do but i cannot say what you would have me and i must tell the truth although it breaks my heart geoffrey i do not love you can i not teach you he pleaded eagerly i have no desire to learn softly she spoke remorseful she looked but the words wounded like a blow all the glad assurance died the passionate glow faded the caress half tender half timid fell away and nothing of the happy lover remained in face or figure he rose slowly as if the heavy disappointment oppressed both soul and body he fixed on her a glance of mingled incredulity reproach and pain and said like one bent on ending suspense at once did you not see that i loved you can you have been trifling with me sylvia i thought you too simple and sincere for heartless coquetry i am you shall not suspect me of that though i deserve all other reproaches i have been very selfish very blind i should not have remembered that in your great kindness you might like me too well for your own peace i should have believed mark and been less candid in my expressions of esteem but i wanted a friend so much i found all i could ask in you i thought my youth my faults my follies would make it impossible for you to see in me anything but a wayward girl who frankly showed her regard and was proud of yours it was one of my sad mistakes i see it now and now it is too late for anything but penitence forgive me if you can i've taken all the pleasure and left you all the pain sylvia spoke in a paroxysm of remorseful sorrow moore listened with a sinking heart and when she dropped her face into her hands again unable to endure the pale expectancy of his he turned away saying with an accent of quiet despair and i have worked and waited all this summer to see my harvest fail at last oh sylvia i so loved you so trusted you he leaned his arm on the low chimney-piece laid down his head upon it and stood silent trying to forgive it is always a hard moment for any woman when it demands her bravest sincerity to look into a countenance of eager love and change it into one of bitter disappointment by the utterance of a monosyllable to sylvia it was doubly hard for now her blindness seemed as incredible as cruel her past frankness unjustifiable her pleasure selfish her refusal the blackest ingratitude and her dream of friendship for ever marred in the brief pause that fell every little service he had rendered her rose freshly in her memory every hour of real content and genuine worth that he had given her seemed to come back and reproach her every look accent action of both happy past and sad present seemed to plead for him her conscience cried out against her her heart overflowed with penitence and pity she looked at him longing to say something do something that should prove her repentance and assure him of the affection which she felt as she looked two great tears fell glittering to the hearth and lay there such eloquent reproaches that had sylvia's heart been hard and cold as the marble where they shone it would have melted then she could not bear it she went to him took in both her own the rejected hand that hung at his side and feeling that no act could tenderly express her sorrow lifted it to her lips and softly kissed it an instant she was permitted to lay her cheek against it as a penitent child mutely imploring pardon might have done then it broke from her hold and gathering her to himself moore looked up exclaiming with renewed hope unaltered longing you do care for me then you give yourself to me in spite of that hard no ah uh, sylvia you are capricious even in your love she could not answer for if that first no had been hard to utter this was impossible it seemed like turning the knife in the wound to disappoint the hope that had gathered strength from despair 
and she could only lay her head down on his breast weeping the saddest tears she had ever shed still happy in his new delusion more softly stroked the shining hair smiling so tenderly so delightedly that it was well for her she did not see the smile the words were enough dear sylvia i have tried so hard to make you love me how could you help it the reason sprung to her lips but maiden pride and shame withheld it what could she tell except that she had cherished a passion based only on a look she had deceived herself in her belief that moore was but a friend might she not also have deceived herself in believing warwick was a lover she could not own the secret its betrayal could not alter her reply nor heal moore's wound but the thought of warwick strengthened her it always did as surely as the influence of his friend always soothed her for one was an embodiment of power the other of tenderness geoffrey let me be true to you and to myself she said so earnestly that it gave way to her broken words i cannot be your wife but i can be your dear friend for ever try to believe this make my task easier by giving up your hope and oh be sure that while i live i cannot do enough to show my sorrow for the great wrong i have done you must it be so i find it very hard to accept the truth and give up the hope that has made my happiness so long let me keep it sylvia let me wait and work again i have a firm belief that you will love me yet because i cleave to you with heart and soul long for you continually and think you the one woman of the world ah if it were only possible she sighed let me make it so in truth i think i should not labor long you are so young dear you have not learned to know your own heart yet it was not pity nor penitence alone that brought you here to comfort me was it sylvia yes had it been love could i stand as i am now and not show it she looked up at him showed him that though her cheeks were wet there was no rosy dawn of passion there though her eyes were as full of affection as of grief there was no shy avoidance of his own no dropping of the lids lest they should tell too much and though his arm encircled her she did not cling to him as loving women cling when they lean on the strength which touched by love can both cherish and sustain that look convinced him better than a flood of words a long sigh broke from his lips and turning from her the eyes that had so wistfully searched and found not they went wandering drearily hither and thither as if seeking the hope whose loss made life seem desolate sylvia saw it groaned within herself but still held fast to the hard truth and tried to make it kinder geoffrey i once heard you say to mark friendship is the best college character can graduate from believe in it seek for it and when it comes keep it as sacredly as love all my life i have wanted a friend have looked for one and when he came i welcomed him may i not keep him and preserve the friendship dear and sacred still although i cannot offer love softly seriously she spoke but the word sounded cold to him friendship seemed so poor now love so rich he could not leave the blessed sunshine which transfigured the whole earth and sit down in the little circle of a kindly fire without keen regret i should say yes i will try to do it if nothing easier remains to me sylvia for five years i have longed and waited for a home duty forbade it then because poor marian had only me to make her sad life happy and my mother left her to my charge now the duty is ended the old house very empty my heart very hungry for affection you are all in all to me and i find it so difficult to relinquish my dream that i must be importunate i have spoken too soon you have had no time to think to look into yourself and question your own heart go now recall what i have said remember that i will wait for you patiently and when i leave an hour hence come down and give me my last answer sylvia was about to speak but the sound of an approaching step brought over her the shyness she had not felt before and without a word she darted from the room then romance also fled for prue came bustling in and moore was called to talk of influenzas while his thoughts were full of love alone in her chamber sylvia searched herself she pictured the life that would be hers with moore the old house so full of something better than its opulence 
an atmosphere of genial tranquillity which made it homelike to whoever crossed its threshold herself the daily companion and dear wife of the master who diffused such sunshine there whose serenity soothed her restlessness whose affection would be as enduring as his patience whose character she so truly honoured she felt that no woman need ask a happier home a truer or more tender lover but when she looked into herself she found the cordial unimpassioned sentiment he first inspired still unchanged and her heart answered this is friendship she thought of warwick and the other home that might be hers fancy painted in glowing colours the stirring life the novelty excitement and ever new delight such wanderings would have for her the joy of being always with him the proud consciousness that she was nearest and dearest to such a man the certainty that she might share the knowledge of his past might enjoy his present help to shape his future there was no time to look into her heart for up sprung its warm blood to her cheek its hope to her eye its longing to her lips its answer glad and ready ah this is love the clock struck ten and after lingering a little sylvia went down slowly because her errand was a hard one thoughtfully because she knew not where nor how she could best deliver it no need to look for him or linger for his coming he was already there alone in the hall absently smoothing a little silken shawl she often wore and waiting with a melancholy patience that smote her to the heart he went to meet her took both her hands in his and looked into her face so tenderly so wistfully sylvia is it good-night or good-bye her eyes filled her hands trembled her colour paled but she answered steadily forgive me it is good-bye end of chapter eight chapter nine of moods this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c moods by louisa may alcott chapter nine holly another gift for you sylvia i don't know the writing but it smells like flowers said mark as a smiling maid brought in a package on christmas morning sylvia tore off the wrapper lifted a cover and exclaimed with pleasure though it was the simplest present she had received that day only an oyster basket graceful in design and shape lined with moss and filled with holly sprays the scarlet berries glowing beautifully among the polished green no note no card no hint of its donor anywhere appeared for none of them recognized the boldly written address presently a thought came to sylvia in a moment the mystery seemed to grow delightfully clear and she said to herself with a glow of joy this is so like adam i know he sent it i must say it is the most peculiar present i ever saw and it is my belief that the boy who brought it stole whatever article of value it contained for it was very carelessly done up no person in their senses would send a few sprigs of common holly to a young lady in this odd way said prue poking here and there in hopes of finding some clue it is not common but very beautiful we seldom see any so large and green and full of berries nor is it odd but very kind because from the worn look of the wrapper i know it has been sent a long way to please me look at the little ferns in the moss and smell the sweet moist odor that seems to take us into summer woods in spite of a snowstorm ah he knew what i should like who knew asked mark quickly you might guess and fearing that she had betrayed herself sylvia hurried across the room to put the holly in water aha i see 
said Mark, laughing. Who is it? asked Prue, looking mystified. Geoffrey, whispered Mr. Yule, with an air of satisfaction. Then all three looked at one another. All three nodded sagely, and all three glanced at the small person bending over the table with cheeks almost as rosy as the berries in her hand. Every one knows what a Christmas party is when a general friendliness pervades the air and good wishes fly about like confetti during carnival. To such a one went Sylvia and Mark that night the brother looking unusually blithe and debonair, because the beloved Jessie had promised to be there if certain aunts and uncles would go away in time, the sister in a costume as pretty as appropriate, for snow and holly made her a perfect yule. Sylvia loved dancing and knew wallflowers only by sight, therefore she was busy. Her lover's gift shone greenly in bosom, hair, and fleecy skirts. Therefore she was beautiful, and the thought that Adam had not forgotten her lay warm at her heart. Therefore she was supremely happy. Mark was devoted, but disappointed, for Jessie did not come, and having doomed the detaining aunts and uncles to a most unblessed fate, he sought consolation among less fair damsels. Now go and enjoy yourself. I shall dance no more round dances, for I'd rather not with any one but you, and you have been a martyr long enough. Mark roamed away, and finding a cool corner, Sylvia watched the animated scene before her till her wandering glance was arrested by the sight of a newcomer and her mind busied with trying to recollect where she had seen him. The slender figure, swarthy face, and vivacious eyes all seemed familiar, but she could not name for their possessor till he caught her eye, when he half bowed and wholly smiled. Then she remembered, and while still recalling that brief interview, one of their young hosts appeared with the stranger, and Gabriel André was duly presented. I could hardly expect to be remembered, and am much flattered, I assure you. Do you suffer from the shower that day, Miss Yule? The speech was nothing, but the foreign accent gave a softness to the words, and the southern grace of manner gave an air of romance to the handsome youth. Sylvia was in the mood to be pleased with everybody, everything, and was unusually gracious as the merrily pursued the subject suggested by his question. Presently he asked, Is Warwick with you now? He is not staying with us, but he, with his friend Mr. Moore. He was the gentleman who pulled so well that day. Yes. Is Warwick with him still? Oh, no, he went away three months ago. I wonder where. So do I. The wish had been impulsively expressed, and was as impulsively echoed. Young André smiled, and liked Miss Yule the better for forgetting that somewhat lofty air of hers. You have no conjecture, then. I wish to find him much very much, but cannot put myself upon his trail. He is so what you call peculiar, that he writes no letters, leaves no address, and roves here and there like a born Giento. Have you ill news for him? I have the best a man could desire, but fear that while I look for him he has gone to make a disappointment for himself. You are a friend, I think. I am. Then you know much of him, his life, his ways? Yes, both from himself and Mr. Moore. Then you know of his betrothal to my cousin, doubtless, and I may speak of it, because you will be so kind you may perhaps help us to find him. I did not know. 
perhaps he did not wish it began sylvia folding one hand tightly in the other with a quick breath and a momentary sensation as if some one had struck her in the face he thinks so little of us i shall not regard his wish just now if you will permit me i would say a word for my cousin's sake as i know you will be interested for her and i do not feel myself strange with you sylvia bowed and standing before her with an air half mannish half boyish gabriel went on in the low rapid tone peculiar to him see then my cousin was betrothed in may a month after adam cries out that he loves too much for his peace that he has no freedom of his heart or mind that he must go away and take his breath before he is made a happy slave for ever attila told me this she implored him to stay but no he vows he will not come again till they marry in the next june he thinks it a weakness to adore a woman impertinate i have no patience for him gabriel spoke indignantly and pressed his foot into the carpet with a scornful look but sylvia took no heed of his petulance she only kept her eyes fixed upon him with an intentness which he mistook for interest the eyes were fine the interest was flattering and though quite aware that he was both taking a liberty and committing a breach of confidence the impulsive young gentleman chose to finish what he had begun and trust that no harm would follow he has been gone now more than half a year but has sent no letter no message nothing to show that he still lives attila waits she writes she grows too anxious to endure she comes to look for him i help her but we do not find him yet and meantime i amuse her my friends are kind and we enjoy much as we look about us for this truant adam if sylvia could have doubted the unexpected revelation this last trait was so like warwick it convinced her at once though the belief to which she had clung so long was suddenly swept from under her she floated silently with no outward sign of shipwreck as her hope went down pride was her shield and crowding back all other emotions she kept herself unnaturally calm behind it till she was alone if gabriel had been watching her he would only have discovered that she was paler blonde than he had thought her that her address was more coldly charming than before and that her eye no longer met his but rested steadily on the folded fan she held he was not watching her however but glancing frequently over her head at something at the far end of the rooms which a crowd of assiduous gentlemen concealed his eye wandered but his thoughts did not for still intent on the purpose that seemed to have brought him to her he said as if reluctant to be inopportunate yet resolved to satisfy himself pardon me that i so poorly entertain you and let me ask one other question in otella's name this moor would he not give us some clue to adam's haunts he is absent and will be till spring i think where i do not know else i could write for you did mr warwick promise to return in june yes then if he lives he will come your cousin must wait it will not be in vain it shall not the young man's voice was stern and a passionate glitter made his black eyes fierce then the former suavity returned and with his most gallant air he said you are kind miss yule i thank you 
and put away this so troublesome affair may i have the honor if he had proposed to waltz over a precipice sylvia felt as if she could have accepted provided there was time to ask a question or two before the crash came a moment after mark was surprised to see her floating round the room on the arm of the olive-coloured party whom he recognized at once his surprise soon changed to pleasure for his beauty-loving eye as well as his brotherly pride was gratified as the whirling couples subsided and the young pair went circling slowly by giving to the graceful pastime the enchantment few have skill to lend it and making it a spectacle of life enjoying youth to be remembered by the lookers-on thank you i have not enjoyed such a waltz since i left cuba it is the rudest of rude things to say but to you i must confide it because you dance like a spaniard the ladies here seem to me as cold as their own snow and they make dancing a duty not a pleasure they should see otella she is all grace and fire i could kill myself dancing with her adam used to say it was like wine to watch her i wish she was here to give us a lesson she is but will not dance to-night here cried sylvia stopping abruptly why not elliot is mad for her and gave me no peace till i brought her she is behind that wall of men shall i make a passage for you she will be glad to talk with you of adam and i to show you the handsomest woman in habana let us wait a little i should be afraid to talk before so many she is very beautiful then you will laugh and call me extravagant as others do if i say what i think so i will let you judge for yourself see your brother stands on tiptoe to peep at her now he goes in and there he will stay you do not like that perhaps but otella can not help her beauty nor the power she has of making all men love her i wish she could she is gifted and accomplished as well as lovely asked sylvia glancing at her companion's gloomy face she is everything a woman should be and i could shoot adam for his cruel neglect gabriel's dark face kindled as he spoke and sylvia drearily wished he would remember how ill-bred it was to tire her with compliments of her friend and raptures over his cousin he seemed to perceive this turn a little haughty at her silence and when he spoke was all the stranger again this is a contradanza shall we give the snow ladies another lesson first may i do myself the pleasure of getting you an ice a glass of water please i am cool enough without more ice he seated her and went upon his errand she was cool now weary-footed sick at heart and yearning to be alone but in these days women do not tear their hair and make scenes though their hearts may ache and burn with the same sharp suffering as of old till her brother came she knew she must bear it and make no sign she did bear it drank the water with a smile danced the dance with spirit and bore up bravely till mark appeared she was just then and his first words were have you seen her no take me where i can and tell me what you know of her nothing but that she is andre's cousin and he adores her as boys always do a charming woman who is kind to them affect to be admiring these flowers and look without her knowing it or she will frown at you like an insulted princess as she did at me 
Sylvia looked, saw the handsomest woman in Havana, and hated her immediately. It was but natural, for Sylvia was a very human girl, and Otella was one whom no woman would love, however much she might admire. Hers was the type of character where every age has reproduced varying externally with climates and conditions but materially the same from fabled circe down to lola montes or some less famous srin whose subjects are not kings the same passions that in ancient days broke out in heaven-defying crimes the same power of beauty intellect or subtly the same untamable spirit and lack of moral sentiment are the attributes of all latent or alert as the noble or ignoble nature may predominate most of us can recall some glimpse of such specimens of nature's work in a daring mood many of our own drawing-rooms have held illustrations of the nobler type and modern men and women have quailed before royal eyes whose possessors ruled all spirits but their own born in athens and endowed with finer intellect otella might have been an aspasia or cast in that great tragedy the french revolution having paid a brave part and died heroically like roland and corday but set down in uneventful times the courage wit and passion that might have served high ends dwindled to their baser counterparts and made her what she was a fair allurement to the eyes of men a born rival to the peace of woman a rudderless nature absolute as fate sylvia possessed no knowledge that could analyze for her the sentiment which repelled even while it attracted toward warwick's betroth that he loved her she did not doubt because she felt that even his pride would yield to the potent fascination of this woman as sylvia looked her feminine eye took in every gift of face and figure every grace of attitude or gesture every daintiness of costume and found no visible flaw in otella from her haughty head to her handsome foot yet when her scrutiny ended the girl felt a sense of disappointment and no envy mingled with her admiration as she stood forgetting to assume interest in the camellias before her she saw gabriel join his cousin saw her pause and look up at him with an anxious question he answered it glancing toward that part of the room where she was standing otella's gaze was fixed upon her instantly a rapid but keen survey followed and then the luxurious eyes turned away with such supreme indifference that sylvia's blood tingled as if she had received an insult mark i'm going home she said abruptly very well i'm ready when safe in her own room sylvia's first act was to take off the holly wreath for her head throbbed with a heavy pain that forbade hope of sleep that night looking at the little chaplet so happily made she saw all the berries had fallen and nothing but the barbed leaves remained a sudden gesture crushed it in both her hands and standing so she gathered many a scattered memory to confirm that night's discovery warwick had said with such a tender accent in his voice i thought of the woman i would make my wife that was otella he had asked so anxiously if one should keep a promise when it disturbed one's peace that was because he repented of his hasty vow to absent himself till june 
it was not love she saw in his eyes the night they parted but pity he read her secret before that compassionate glance revealed it to herself and he had gone away to spare her fully further folly she had deceived herself half blindly cherished a baseless hope and this was the end even for the nameless gift she found a reason with a woman's skill in self-torture moore had met adam had told his disappointment and still pitying her warwick had sent the pretty greeting to console her for the loss of both friend and lover this thought seemed to sting her in sudden passion as if longing to destroy every trace of delusion she tore away the holly wreaths and flung them in the fire took down the bow and arrow warwick had made her from above the egate where she had arranged the spoils of her happy voyage snapped them across her knee and sent them after the holly followed by the birch canoe and every pebble moss shell or bunch of headed grass he had given her then the osier basket was not spared the box went next and even the wrapper was on its way to immolation when as she rent it apart with a stern pleasure in the sacrifice it was going to complete from some close fold of the paper hitherto undisturbed a card dropped at her feet she caught it up and read in handwriting almost as familiar as her own to sylvia a merry christmas and best wishes from her friend geoffrey moore the word friend was underscored as if he desired to assure her that he still cherished the only tie permitted him and sent the green token to lighten her regret that she could not give no more warm over sylvia's sore heart rushed the tender thought and longing as her tears began to flow he cares for me he remembered me i wish he would come back and comfort me End of chapter 9 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 10 of Moods This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jenny McCann Moods by Louisa May Alcott. Chapter 10. Yes. It is easy to say, I will forget, but perhaps the hardest task given us is to lock up a natural yearning of the heart and turn a deaf ear to its plaint, for captive and jailer must inhabit the same small cell. Sylvia was proud, with that pride which is both sensitive and courageous, which can not only suffer but wring strength from suffering. While she struggled with a grief and shame that aged her with their pain, she asked no help, made no complaint. But when the forbidden passion stretched its arms to her, she thrust it back and turned to pleasure for oblivion. Those who knew her best were troubled and surprised by the craving for excitement which now took possession of her, the avidity with which she gratified it, regardless of time, health, and money. All day she hurried here and there, driving, shopping, sightseeing, or entertaining guests at home. Night brought no cessation of her dissipation, for when balls, masquerades, and concerts failed, there still remained the theater. This soon became both a refuge and a solace, for believing it to be less harmful than other excitements, her father indulged her new whim. But had she known it, this was the most dangerous pastime she could have chosen. Calling for no exertion of her own, it left her free to passively receive a stimulant to her unhappy love in watching its mimic semblance through all phases of tragic suffering and sorrow, for she would see no comedies, and Shakespeare's tragedies became her study. 
This lasted for a time, then the reaction came. A black melancholy fell upon her, and energy deserted soul and body. She found it a weariness to get up in the morning, and weariness to lie down at night. She no longer cared even to seem cheerful, owned that she was spiritless, hoped she should be ill, and did not care if she died to-morrow. When this dark mood seemed about to become chronic, she began to mend. For youth is wonderfully recuperative, and the deepest wounds soon heal even against the sufferer's will. A quiet apathy replaced the gloom, and she let the tide drift her where it would, hoping nothing, expecting nothing, asking nothing, but that she need not suffer any more. She lived fast, all processes with her were rapid, and the secret experience of that winter taught her many things. She believed it had only taught her to forget, for now the outcast's love lay very still, and no longer beat despairingly against the door of her heart, demanding to be taken in from the cold. She fancied that neglect had killed it, and that its grave was green with many tears. Alas for Sylvia! How could she know that it had only sobbed itself to sleep, and would wake beautiful and strong at the first sound of its master's voice? Mark became eventful. In his fitful fashion he had painted a picture of the golden wedding, from sketches taken at the time. Moore had suggested and bespoken it, that the young artist might have a motive for finishing it, because, though he excelled in scenes of that description, he thought them beneath him, and tempted by more ambitious designs, neglected his true branch of the art. In April it was finished, and at his father's request, Mark reluctantly sent it with his Clytemnestra to the annual exhibition. One morning at breakfast Mr. Yule suddenly laughed out behind his paper, and with a face of unmixed satisfaction passed it to his son, pointing to a long critique upon the exhibition. Mark prepared himself to receive with becoming modesty the praises lavished upon his great work, but was stricken with amazement to find Clytemnestra disposed of in a single sentence, and the golden wedding lauded in a long, enthusiastic paragraph. "'What the deuce does the man mean?' he ejaculated, staring at his father. "'He means that the work which warms the heart is greater than that which freezes the blood, I suspect.' Moore knew what you could do, and has made you do it, sure that if you worked for fame unconsciously you should achieve it. This is a success that I can appreciate, and I congratulate you heartily, my son. Thank you, sir, but upon my word I don't understand it, and if this wasn't written by the best art critic in the country I should feel inclined to say the writer was a fool. Why, that little thing was a daub compared to the other." He got no farther in his protest against this unexpected freak of fortune, for Sylvia seized the paper and read the paragraph aloud with such happy emphasis, amid Prue's outcries and his father's applause, that Mark began to feel that he really had done something praiseworthy, and that the daub was not so despicable after all. "'I'm going to look at it from this new point of sight,' was his sole comment as he went away. Three hours afterward he appeared to Sylvia as she sat sewing alone, and startled her with the mysterious announcement, "'I've done it!' "'Done what? Have you burnt poor Clytemnestra?' "'Hang Clytemnestra! I'll begin at the beginning, and prepare you for the grand finale. I went to the exhibition, and stared at Father Blake and his family for an hour. Decided that wasn't bad, though I still admire the other more.' Then people began to come and crowd up, so that I slipped away, for I couldn't stand the compliments. Dalman, Scott, and all the rest of my tribe were there, and, as true as my name is Mark Yule, every man of them ignored the Greek party and congratulated me upon the success of that confounded golden wedding. My dearest boy, I am so proud, so glad! What is the matter? Have you been bitten by a tarantula? She might well ask, for Mark was dancing all over the carpet in a most extraordinary style, and only stopped long enough to throw a little case into Sylvia's lap, asking, as a whole face full of smiles broke loose, "'What does that mean?' She opened it, and a suspicious circlet of diamonds appeared, at sight of which she clapped her hands and cried out, "'You're going to ask Jessie to wear it!' 
I have, I have, sung Mark, dancing more wildly than ever. Sylvia chased him into a corner and held him there, almost as much excited as he, while she demanded a full explanation, which he gave her, laughing like a boy and blushing like a girl. You have no business to ask, but of course I'm dying to tell you. I went from that painter's purgatory, as we call it, to Mr. Hope's, and asked for Miss Jessie. My angel came down. I told her of my success, and she smiled as never a woman did before. I added that I'd only waited to make myself more worthy of her, by showing that I had talent, as well as love, and money to offer her, and she began to cry, whereat I took her in my arms and ascended straight into heaven. "'Please be sober, Mark, and tell me all about it. Was she glad? Did she say she would? And is everything as we would have it?' It is all perfect, divine and rapturous, to the last degree. Jessie has liked me ever since she was born, she thinks. Adores you and Prue for sisters. Yearns to call my parent father. Allowed me to say and do whatever I liked, and gave me a ravishing kiss just there. Sacred spot. I shall get a mate to it when I put this on her blessed little finger. Try it for me. I want it to be right, and your hands are of a size. That fits grandly. "'When shall I see a joyful sweetheart doing this on his own behalf, Sylvia?' "'Never.' She shook off the ring as if it burned her, watching it roll glittering away, with a somewhat tragical expression. Then she calmed herself, and sitting down to her work, enjoyed Mark's raptures for an hour. The distant city bells were ringing nine that night, as a man paused before Mr. Yule's house, and attentively scrutinized each window. Many were alight, but on the drawn curtain of one, a woman's shadow came and went. He watched in a moment, passed up the steps, and noiselessly went in. The hall was bright and solitary. From above came the sound of voices. From a room to the right, the stir of papers and the scratch of a pen. From one on the left, a steady rustle, as of silk, swept slowly to and fro. To the threshold of this door the man stepped and looked in. Sylvia was just turning in her walk, and as she came musing down the room, Moore saw her well. With some women, dress has no relation to states of mind. With Sylvia, it was often an indication of the mental garb she wore. Moore remembered this trait, and saw in both countenance and costume the change that had befallen her in his long absence. Her face was neither gay nor melancholy, but serious and coldly quiet as if some inward twilight reigned. Her dress, a soft, sad gray, with no decoration but a knot of snowdrops in her bosom. On these pale flowers her eyes were fixed, and as she walked with folded arms and drooping head, she sang low to herself. Upon the convent roof the snows lie sparkling to the moon. My breath to heaven like incense goes. May my soul follow soon. Lord, make my spirit pure and clear, as are the frosty skies, or this first snowdrop of the year that in my bosom lies. Sylvia! Very gentle was the call, but she started as if it had been a shout, looked an instant while light and color flashed into her face, then ran to him, exclaiming joyfully, Oh, Geoffrey, I am glad, I am glad! There could be but one answer to such a welcome, and Sylvia received it as she stood there, not weeping now, but smiling, with the sincerest satisfaction, the happiest surprise. Moore shared both emotions, feeling as a man might feel when, parched with thirst, he stretches out his hand for a drop of rain and receives a brimming cup of water. He drank a deep draught gratefully then, fearing that it might be as suddenly withdrawn, asked anxiously, "'Sylvia, are we friends or lovers?' anything if you will only stay she looked up as she spoke and her face betrayed that a conflict between desire and doubt was going on within her impulse had sent her there and now it was so sweet to know herself beloved she found it hard to go away her brother's happiness had touched her heart roused the old craving for affection and brought a strong desire to fill the aching void her lost love had left with this recovered one Sylvia had not learned to reason yet, she could only feel, because owing to the unequal development of her divided nature, 
the heart grew faster than the intellect. Instinct was her surest guide, and when she followed it, unblinded by a passion, unthwarted by a mood, she prospered. But now she was so blinded and so thwarted, and now her great temptation came. Ambition, man's idol, had tempted the father. Love, woman's god, tempted the daughter. And as if the father's atonement was to be wrought out through his dearest child, the daughter also made the fatal false step of her life. "'Then you have learned to love me, Sylvia?' "'No. The old feeling has not changed except to grow more remorseful, more eager to prove its truth. Once you asked me if I did not wish to love you. Then I did not. Now I sincerely do.' If you still want me with my many faults, and will teach me in your gentle way to be all I should to you, I will gladly learn, because I never needed love as I do now. Geoffrey, shall I stay or go? Stay, Sylvia. Ah, thank God for this. If she had ever hoped that Moore would forget her for his own sake, she now saw how vain such hope would have been, and was both touched and troubled by the knowledge of her supremacy which that hour gave her. She was as much the calmer as friendship is than love, and was the first to speak again, still standing there content although her words expressed a doubt. "'Are you very sure you want me? Are you not tired of the thorn that has fretted you so long?' Remember I am so young, so ignorant, and unfitted for a wife. Can I give you real happiness? Make home what you would have it, and never see in your face regret that some wiser, better woman was not in my place? I am sure of myself, and satisfied with you, as you are no wiser, no better, nothing but my Sylvia. It is very sweet to hear you say that with such a look. I do not deserve it, but I will. Is the pain I once gave you gone now, Geoffrey? Gone forever. Then I am satisfied, and will begin my life anew by trying to learn well the lesson my kind master is to teach me. When Moore went that night, Sylvia followed him, and as they stood together, this happy moment seemed to recall that other sad one, for taking her hands again, he asked, smiling now, Dear, is it good night or good bye? It is good bye, and come to morrow. End of chapter 10。Chapter 11 of Moods。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, BC. Moods. By Louisa May Alcott Chapter 11 Wooing Nothing could have been more unlike than the two pairs of lovers who from April to August haunted Mr. Ewell's house. One pair was of the popular order, for Mark was tenderly tyrannical, Jesse adoringly submissive, and at all hours of the day they were to be seen making tableau of themselves. The other pair were of the peculiar order, undemonstrative and unsentimental, but quite as happy. Moore knew his power, but used it generously, asking little while giving much. Sylvia as yet found nothing to regret, for so gently was she taught. The lesson could not seem hard and when her affection remained unchanged in kind, although it deepened in degree, she said within herself, That strong and sudden passion was not true love, but an unwise, unhappy delusion of my own. I should be glad that it is gone, because I know I am not fit to be Warwick's wife. This quiet feeling which Geoffrey inspires must be a safer love for me, and I should be grateful that in making his happiness I may yet find my own. She tried heartily to forget herself in others, unconscious that there are times when the duty we owe ourselves is greater than that we owe to them. In the atmosphere of cheerfulness that now surrounded her, 
she could not but be cheerful and soon it would have been difficult to find a more harmonious household than this one little cloud alone remained to mar the general sunshine mark was in a frenzy to be married but had set his heart on a double wedding and sylvia would not fix the time always pleading let me be quite sure of myself before i take this step and do not wait matters stood thus till mark having prepared his honeymoon cottage as a relief to his impatience found it so irresistible that he announced his marriage for the first of august and declared no human power should change his purpose sylvia promised to think of it but gave no decided answer for though she would hardly own it to herself she longed to remain free until june was past it came and went without a sign and july began before the longing died a sudden death and she consented to be married mark and jessie came in from the city one warm morning and found sylvia sitting idly in the hall she left her preparations all to prue who reveled in such things and applied herself diligently to her lesson as if afraid she might not learn it as she should halfway up stairs mark turned and said laughing sylvia i saw cyril to-day one of the fellows whom we met on the river last summer and he began to tell me something about andre and the splendid cousin who is married and gone abroad it seems i did not hear much for jessie was waiting but you remember the handsome cubans we saw at christmas don't you yes i remember well i thought you'd like to know that the lad had gone home to cleopatra's wedding so you cannot have him to dance at yours have you forgotten how you waltzed that night no i have not forgotten mark went off to consult prue and jessie began to display her purchases before eyes that only saw a blur of shapes and colors and expatiate upon their beauties to ears that only heard the words the splendid cousin is married and gone abroad i should enjoy these pretty things a thousand times more if you would please us all by being married when we are sighed jessie looking at her pearls i will what really sylvia you are perfect darling mark prue she says she will away flew jessie to proclaim the glad tidings and sylvia with a curious expression of relief regret and resolve repeated to herself that decided i will every one took care that miss caprice should not have time to change her mind the whole house was soon in a bustle for prue ruled supreme mr ewell fled from the din of women's tongues the bridegrooms were kept on a very short allowance of bride and sylvia and jessie were almost invisible for milliners and mantua makers swarmed about them till they felt like animated pincushions the last evening came at length and sylvia was just planning an escape into the garden when prue whose tongue wagged as rapidly as her hands worked exclaimed how can you stand staring out of a window when there is so much to do here are all these trunks to pack maria in her bed with every tooth in a frightful state of inflammation and that capable john watts her name gone off a while i was putting a chamomile poultice on her face if you are tired sit down and try on all your shoes for though mr peggett has your measure those absurd clerks seem to think it a compliment to send children's sizes to grown women i am sure my rubbers were a perfect insult 
Sylvia sat down, tugged on one boot, and fell into a reverie with the other in her hand, while Prue clacked on like a word mill in full operation. How am I ever to get all these gowns into the trunk passes my comprehension. There's a tray for each, of course, but a ball dress is such a fractious thing. I could shake that Antoinette Roche for disappointing you at the last minute. And what you are to do for a maid, I don't know. You'll have so much dressing to do you will be quite worn out. And I want you to look your best on all occasions, for you will meet everybody. This collar won't wear well. Clara hasn't a particle of judgment, though her taste is sweet. These hose, now, are a good, firm article. I chose them myself. Do be sure you get all your things from the wash. At those great hotels there's a deal of pilfering, and you are so careless. Here Sylvia came out of her reverie with a sigh that was almost a groan. Don't they fit? I knew they wouldn't, said Prue, with an air of triumph. The boots suit me, but the hotels do not, and if it was not ungrateful, after all your trouble, I should like to make a bonfire of this roomful of haberdashery, and walk quietly away to my new home by the light of it. As if the bare idea of such an awful proceeding robbed her of all her strength, Miss Ewell sat suddenly down in the trunk by which she was standing. Fortunately, it was nearly full, but her appearance was decidedly ludicrous as she sat with the collar in one uplifted hand, the hose in the other, and the ball dress laid over her lap like a fainting lady while she said with imploring solemnity which changed abruptly from the pathetic to the comic at the end of her speech sylvia if i ever cherished a wish in this world of disappointment it is that your wedding shall have nothing peculiar about it because every friend and relation you've got expects it do let me have the comfort of knowing that every one was surprised and pleased, for if the expression was elegant, which it isn't, and only suggested by my trials with those dressmakers, I should say I was on pins and needles till it's all over. Bless me, and so I am, for here are three on the floor and one in my shoe. Prue paused to extract the appropriate figure of speech which she had chosen, and Sylvia said, If we have everything else as you wish, would you mind if we didn't go the journey? Of course I should. Everyone goes a wedding trip. It's part of the ceremony, and if two carriages and two bridal pairs don't leave here tomorrow, I shall feel as if all my trouble had been thrown away. I'll go, Prue. I'll go, and you shall be satisfied. But I thought we might go from here in style, and then slip off on some quieter trip. I am tired. I dread the idea of frolicking for a whole month, as Mark and Jessie mean to do. It was Prue's turn to groan now, and she did so dismally, but Sylvia had never asked a favor in vain, and this was not the moment to refuse to her anything. So worldly pride yielded to sisterly affection, and Prue said with resignation, as she fell to work more vigorously than ever, because she had wasted five good minutes. Do as you like, dear. You shall not be crossed on your last day at home. Ask Geoffrey, and if you are happy, I am satisfied. Before Sylvia could thank her sister, there came a tap and a voice asking, Might I come in? If you can get in, answered Prue, 
as reversing her plan in a hurry she whisked the collar into a piece bag and the hose into a bandbox moore paused on the threshold in a masculine maze the one small person could need so much drapery may i borrow sylvia for a while a breath of air will do her good and i want her bright and blooming for to-morrow else young mrs yule will outshine young mrs moore what a thoughtful creature you are geoffrey take her and welcome only pray put on a shawl sylvia and don't stay out late for a bride with a cold in her head is the saddest of spectacles glad to be released sylvia went away and dropping the shawl as soon as she was out of prue's sight paced up and down the garden walks upon her lover's arm having heard her wish and given a hearty assent moore asked where shall we go tell me what you would like best and you shall have it you will not let me give you many gifts but this pleasure you will accept from me i know you give me yourself that is more than i deserve but i should like to have you take me to the place you'd like best don't tell me beforehand let it be a surprise i will it is already settled and i know you will like it is there any other wish to be granted no doubt to be set at rest or regret withheld that i should know tell me sylvia for if ever there should be confidence between us it is now as he spoke the desire to tell him of her love for adam rose within her but with the desire came a thought that modified the form in which impulse prompted her to make confession moore was both sensitive and proud would not the knowledge of the fact mar for him the friendship that was so much to both from warwick he would never learn it from her he should have only a half confidence and so love both friend and wife with an untroubled heart few of us can always control the rebellious nature that so often betrays and then reproaches few always weigh the moment and the act that bans or blesses it and where is the life that has not known some turning point when a fugitive emotion has decided great issues for good or ill such an emotion came to sylvia then and another temptation wearing the guise of generosity urged her to another false step for when the first is taken a second inevitably follows i have no wish no regret nothing but the old doubt of my unstable self and the fear that i may fail to make you happy but i should like to tell you something i don't know that you will care for it or that there is any need to tell it but when you said there should be confidence between us i felt that i wanted you to know that i had loved some one before i loved you he did not see her face he only heard her quiet voice he had no thought of adam whom she had known so short a time who was already bound he only fancied that she spoke of some young lover who had touched her heart and while he smiled at the nice sense of honor that prompted the innocent confession he said with no coldness no curiosity in voice or face no need to tell it dear i have no jealousy of any one who has gone before me rest assured of this for if i could not share so large a heart with one who will never claim my chair i should not deserve it that is so like you now i am quite at ease he looked down at her as she went beside him thinking that of all the brides he had ever seen his own looked least like one 
i always thought that you would make a very ardent lover sylvia that you would be excited gay and brilliant at a time like this but you are so quiet so absorbed and so unlike your former self that i begin to think i do not know you yet you will in time i am passionate and restless by nature but i am also very sensitive to all influences personal or otherwise and were you different from your tranquil sunshiny self i too should change i am quiet because i seem in a pleasant state half waking half dreaming from which i never wish to wake i am tired of the past contented with the present and to you i leave the future it shall be a happy one if i can make it so and to-morrow you will give me the dear right to try yes she said and thinking of the solemn promises to be then made she added thoughtfully i think i love i know i honor i will try to obey can i do more well for them both if they could have known that friendship is love's twin and the gentle sisters are too often mistaken for each other that sylvia was innocently deceiving both her lover and herself by wrapping her friendship in the garb her lost love had worn forgetting that the wanderer might return and claim his own leaving the other to suffer for the borrowed warmth they did not know it and walked tranquilly together in the summer night planning the new life as they went and when they parted more pointed to a young moon hanging in the sky see sylvia our honeymoon has risen may it be a happy one it will be and when the anniversary of this glad night comes around it shall be shining still God bless my little wife. End of chapter 11. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 12 of Moods. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Moods by Louisa May Alcott chapter twelve wedding sylvia was awakened on her wedding morning by a curious choking sound and starting up found prue crying over her as if her heart were broken what has happened is geoffrey ill is all the silver stolen can't the bishop come she asked wondering what calamity could move her sister to tears at such a busy time prue took sylvia in her arms and rocking to and fro as if she were still a baby poured forth a stream of words and tears together nothing has happened oh, i came to call you and broke down because it was the last time i should do it i've been awake all night thinking of you and all you've been to me since i took you in my arms nineteen years ago and said you should be mine my little sylvia i've been neglectful of so many things and now i see them all i've fretted you with my ways and haven't been patient enough with yours i've been selfish even about your wedding and it won't be as nice as you like you'll reproach me in your heart and i shall hate myself for it when you are gone never to be in my care and comfort any more and oh my dear my dear what shall i do without you this unexpected demonstration from her prosaic sister touched sylvia more than the most sentimental lamentations from another it brought to mind all the past devotion the future solitude of prue's life and she clung about her neck tearless but very tender i never shall reproach you never cease to love and thank you for all you've been to me my dear old girl you mustn't grieve over me or think i shall forget you for you never shall be forsaken and very soon i shall be back almost as much your sylvia as ever mark will live on one side i shall live on the other and we'll be merry and cosy together and who knows but when we are both out of your way you will learn to think of yourself and marry also at this prue began to laugh hysterically and exclaimed with more than her usual incoherency oh, i must tell you it was so very odd i didn't mean to do so because you children would tease me but now i will make you laugh for it's a bad omen to cry over a bride they say 
my dear, that gouty Mr. McGregor, when I went in with some of my nice broth last week, after he had eaten every drop before my eyes, wiped his mouth and asked me to marry him. And you would not, Prue? Bless me, child, how could I? I must take care of my poor dear father, and he isn't pleasant in the least, you know, but would wear my life out in a week. I really pitied him, however, when I refused him with a napkin round his neck, and he tapped his waistcoat with a spoon so comically when he offered me his heart as if it was something good to eat. How very funny! What made him do it, Prue? He said he'd watched the preparations from his window and got so interested in weddings that he wanted one himself, and felt drawn to me I was so sympathetic. That means a good nurse and a cook, my dear. I understand these invalid gentlemen, and will be a slave to no man so fat and fussy as Mr. Mac, as my brother calls him. It's not respectful, but I like to refresh myself by saying it just now. Never mind, old soul, Prue, but go and have your breakfast comfortably, for there's much to be done, and no one is to dress me but your own dear self. At this, Prue relapsed into the pathetic again, and cried over her sister, as if, despite the omen, brides were plants that needed much watering. The appearance of the afflicted Maria, with her face still partially eclipsed by the chamomile comforter, and an announcement that the waiters had come and were ordering round dreadful, caused Prue to pocket her handkerchief and descend to turn the tables in every sense of the word. The prospect of the wedding breakfast made the usual meal a mere mockery. Every one was in a driving hurry, every one was very much excited, and nobody but Prue and the colored gentleman brought anything to pass. Sylvia went from room to room, bidding them good-bye as the child who had played there for so long, but each looked unfamiliar in its state and festival array. The odd house seemed to have forgotten her already. She spent an hour with her father, paid Mark a little call in the studio where he was bidding adieu to the joys of bachelorhood and preparing himself for the jars of matrimony by a composing smoke, and then Prue claimed her. The agony she had suffered during the long toilette are beyond the powers of language to portray, for Prue surpassed herself and was the very essence of fussiness. But Sylvia bore it patiently, as a last sacrifice, because her sister was very tender-hearted still, and laughed and cried over her work till all was done, when she surveyed the effect with pensive satisfaction. "'You are very sweet, my dear, and so delightfully calm. You really do surprise me. I always thought you'd have hysterics on your wedding day, and I got my vinaigrette all ready.' keep your hands just as they are with the handkerchief and bouquet it looks very easy and rich dear me what a spectacle i've made of myself but i shall cry no more not even during the ceremony as many do such displays of feeling are in very bad taste and i shall be firm perfectly firm so if you hear any one sniff you'll know it isn't me now i must scramble on my dress first let me arrange you smoothly in a chair there my precious now think of soothing things and don't stir till geoffrey comes for you too tired to care what happened just then sylvia sat as she was placed feeling like a fashion plate of a bride and wishing she could go to sleep presently the sound of steps as fleet as marks but lighter waked her up and forgetting orders she rustled to the door with an expression which fashion plates have not yet attained good morning little bride good morning bonny bridegroom then they looked at one another and both smiled. But they seemed to have changed characters, for Moore's usually tranquil face was full of pale excitement, Sylvia's usually vivacious one, full of quietude, and her eyes were the unquestioning content of a child who accepts some friendly hand, sure that it would lead it right. Prue desires me to take you out into the upper hall, and when Mr. Dean beckons we are to go down at once. The rooms are full and Jessie is ready. Shall we go? One moment. Geoffrey, are you quite happy now? Supremely happy. Then it shall be the first duty of my life to keep you so. Then with a gesture yet soft but solemn, Sylvia laid her hand in his as if endowing him with both gift and giver. He held it fast and never let it go until it was his own. In the upper hall they found Mark hovering about Jessie like an agitated bee, about a very full-blown flower, and Clara Dean flapping away lest he should damage the effect of this beautiful white rose. For ten minutes, ages they seemed, the five stood together listening to the stir below, looking at one another till they were tired of the sight and scent of orange blossoms and wishing that the whole affair was safely over. But the instant a portentous ahem was heard and a white glove seen to beckon from the stair-foot, everyone fell into a flutter. 
Moore turned pallor still, and Sylvia felt his heart beat hard against her hand. She herself was seized with a momentary desire to run away and say no again. Mark looked as if nerving himself for immediate execution, and Jessie feebly whispered, "'Oh, Clara, I'm going to faint!' "'Good heavens, what shall I do with her? "'Mark, support her! "'My darling girl, smell this and bear up. "'For mercy's sake, do something, Sylvia, "'and don't stand there looking as if you'd been married every day for a year.' "'In his excitement, Mark gave his bride a little shake. "'Its effect was marvellous. "'She rallied instantly with a reproachful glance at her crumpled veil "'and decided, come quick, I can go now.' "'Down they went through a wilderness of summer silks, "'black coats, and bridal gloves.' How they reached their places none of them ever knew. Mark said afterward that the instinct of self-preservation led him to the only means of extrication that circumstances allowed. The moment the bishop opened his book, Prue took out her handkerchief and cried steadily through the whole ceremony, for dear as were the proprieties, the children were dearer still. At Sylvia's desire, Mark was married first, and as she stood listening to the sonorous roll of the service falling from the bishop's lips, she tried to feel devout and solemn, but failed to do so. She tried to keep her thoughts from wandering, but continually found if that sob came from Prue, if her father felt it very much, and when it would be done. She tried to keep her eyes fixed timidly upon the carpet, as she had been told to do so, but they would rise and glance about against her will. One of these derelictions from the path of duty nearly produced a catastrophe. Little Tilly, the gardener's pretty child, had strayed in from among the servants, peeping at a long window in the rear, and established herself near the wedding group, looking like a small ballet girl in her full white frock and wreath, pushed rakishly askew on her curly pate. As she stood regarding the scene with dignified amazement, her eye met Sylvia's. In spite of the unusual costume, the baby knew her playmate, and running to her, thrust her head under the veil with a delighted peep a -pole. Horror seized Jessie. Mark was on the brink of a laugh, and Moore looked like one fallen from the clouds. But Sylvia drew the little Marplot close to her with a warning word, and there she stayed, quietly amusing herself with pouring the silvery dress, smelling the flowers, and staring at the bishop. After this, all prospered. The gloves came smoothly off, the rings went smoothly on, no one cried but Prue, no one laughed but Tilly, the brides were admired, the grooms were envied, the service pronounced impressive, and when it ended a tumult of congratulations arose. Sylvia always had a very confused idea of what happened during the next hour. She remembered being kissed till her cheeks burned and shaken hands with till her fingers tingled, bowing in answer to toasts and forgetting to reply when addressed by her new name, trying to eat and drink and discovering that everything tasted of wedding cake, finding herself upstairs, hurrying on her traveling dress, then downstairs saying goodbye, and when her father embraced her last of all, suddenly, realizing with a pang that she was married and going away, never to be little Sylvia any more. Prue was gratified to her heart's content, for when the two bridal carriages had vanished with handkerchiefs flying from their windows in answer to the white whirlwind on the lawn, Mrs. Grundy, with an approving smile on her aristocratic countenance, pronounced this the most charming affair of the season. End of chapter 12